all of the packages we're covering today except Python. I haven't touched that one yet. And I really like machine learning and data mining. So I'll hand over to Brad now to quickly introduce himself. Yeah, uh, thanks, Breaker. I'm Brad. I'm a statistical consultant in the Stats Consulting Center. Um, R Studio is my go-to, but I do commonly use other packages both in teaching and with, with clients. Um, my main interests are in data privacy, probability theory, general statistical inference, and data analytics. Um, I'm very passionate about the ethical use and ap applications of data science uh, in both research and in industry. And I will enjoy learning and collaborating with all other disciplines, um, solving real world problems, and I'm always up for a chat. So you're always welcome to, to send me an email and ask me questions. And over to Alberto. Hello there. So uh, my name is Alberto Netelaguirre. I am the director for the Center for Health and Social Analytics. I'm a professor of biostatistics. Uh, I like to think of myself as a crusader for the correct use and understanding of biostatistics because uh, I mean, if you see my emails, you see a lot of people do weird things. So anyway, uh, I do enjoy teaching uh, what I call stats without pain to other disciplines. I think uh, the more I try to explain it, the more I understand. And uh, just as Brad, R and R Studio are my preference. Uh, I'm not a, I'm not as as uh, versed as uh, Brad, but it's my preference and what I usually do. But uh, Stata, SPSS, and others are not foreign to me mainly because it's what other collaborators use, right? Um, I was able to have some exposure to Python due to some consultancy work for the government in, in Canada. Uh, and I have a interest, uh, although it didn't appear there, but I do have interest in uh, social networks, in biostatistics, uh, and you know, I'm always wanting to learn and try new techniques. Great, thank you. Okay, so just a little bit now about the um, hopefully the data and decision science initiative. So the reason we're here today is because of this initiative, which part it is is part of the UOW strategic plan, and this actually developed from a review of UOW's capacity in big data back in two thousand and nineteen. And it's been updated, obviously, to reflect resources in the post-COVID universe. And it commenced in July last year. So basically, the structure of the initiative is here. Um, I'm coordinating the initiative and I report to the DVC RNI through the University Research Committee. We have a steering committee that meets twice a year and we'll be getting an external advisory committee later on this year. And the real working parts of the UOW Data and Decision Science Initiative are the network, which is what we're participating in today, where we're giving themed presentations to try and um, improve data literacy and encourage people's interest in data science. We also have some working groups. We have a methods working group, which is looking at collaborative research um, on unique data sets to the Illawarra region, capitalizing on our strength in various methods at UOW, which are these ones listed here. And we also have an education working group, which is looking at developing resources for teaching data science and stats. So if anyone's particularly interested in those, um, please get in touch. Okay, so the, the four key areas of focus of the initiative are encouraging research. As I said, I've um, highlighted here at the themed meeting, meetings, which is what we're doing today. But the, the initiative and the network really represent a focal point for coordinating data science at UOW and being able to promote our capacity in data science. We also have a really big focus on education. So that's both internal and external training and upskilling research students and staff in data and decision science methods with a focus on reproducible research. We also have some workshops, we'll talk about those at the end. We're also looking at reviewing our subjects to make them more data science focused. And we're also um, engaging with industry to promote data science at UOW. Okay, so now to get on to our topic of interest for today. So choosing a stats package. So there are a number of things you need to think about when you think about choosing a particular stats package. And the first one is, why do you need the stats package? 
So some people might just want to do some data manipulation. Most people would be wanting to do things like descriptive statistics, visualization, modeling and inference. And some people are here because they might need to use a stats package for teaching. So it really depends on which one of these is your focus, which particular stats package is best for you. Most stats packages do everything, but some of them do some tasks better than other tasks. So if you're interested in the middle three here, which most of you probably are, then the other real thing that you need to think about is what is your research question and what type of inference and visualization and descriptive statistics do you need? Because once again, although most stats packages do most methods, some of them have strengths in different areas. And there are some packages which do more advanced methods of a particular type that other packages don't do so well or don't have the capacity to do at all. You also need to think about what did your, your data look like? So I'll talk about those a little bit more next. So when we're talking about your research question, what are you aiming to do? So again, this gets back to um, the middle three that I was talking about in terms of descriptives, visualization and inference. So is your project just looking at describing a sample? Are you just going to be doing some descriptive statistics and developing some tables and visualizations? So most stats packages do descriptive statistics fairly well. So if that's, if that's what you have to do, then all of the packages that we're considering will be fine for that. If you're looking at basic differences between groups or relationships between groups, so um, some basic t-tests, correlations and basic regressions, all of those things are also done very well by all statistical packages. If visualization is really important to you, then there are definitely packages that do visualization better than others. And we'll be covering that um, when we talk about the, the different packages today. And then there are some specialized methods. Now I've just mentioned a few issues here that have come up quite a lot um, in my time here doing statistical consulting. And I'm sure Brad and Alberto would agree that these are common things that we have to deal with. But there are other considerations, for example, if you're dealing with survey data, some packages handle that better than others. If you're investigating change over time and it's fairly straightforward, then all packages can handle that sort of analysis. But if you've got complicated structures or a lot of missing data or clustered or multi-level data, then different packages um, have different approaches to handling this and, it, and it's easier to do these sort of methods in the different sort of packages. So they're the sort of things that you need to think about in terms of your modeling. Also, if you have a, a much more complicated models, so if you're dealing with non-linearities, assumption violations or interactions, then some of the more advanced um, packages we'll be talking about are probably better options for you. Okay, and then there's what does your data look like? So you also need to think about the size of your data set. Um, some, of the data, some of the packages we'll be talking about are better for, covering, uh, for handling bigger data sets than others. And then there are things about that there are other issues. A lot of um, people these days are looking at linked data or complicated relational or administrative data. You also need to think about whether you're going to be working on this project for a long time. Because if you are, you really need to think about a package that encourages reproducible research or allows you to document your code as you go along so that you can remember what you've done when you come back to it. And you also need to think about whether you're working with other collaborators and what sort of packages they're using. So you need to think about whether the methods you're doing work with their packages or look at what packages they're using and perhaps think about the same thing. And also, are you teaching with stats software? Because there are a couple of packages we're covering today that um, are particularly easy to, to teach with. So how many stats packages are there? Whoop, this is skipping ahead. So there are lots. So here are just some of the open free stats and data science packages that are available. So as you can see, there, there are many, um, and we'll be talking about a couple today. So we'll be talking about R, and we'll be talking about an implementation of R in a, a, a user interface. 
And there are also proprietary stats packages. And there are lots of those as well. So many of these are quite specialized to different disciplines. For example, a lot of people in economics use eViews um, at, at UOW. And there are other ones here that are quite specialized. Um, Primer is another one that's used here in some disciplines as well. So there are many, many different packages and most of them do general analysis okay. And some of them are free. Some of them cost a few dollars. Some of them cost a lot of money. So you need to make a decision about what you need and which one might be appropriate for you. And that's what we're going to be discussing a bit today. But what we're going to talk about are the ones that are commonly used at UOW. So you can see that there are many, many, many packages and we haven't got time to cover them all. So we're just going to stick to the ones that are available here or most often used by researchers and students. So the first one we're going to talk about is, uh, so what we're going to do is we're just going to quickly give you an introduction to the package and where it came from. And then we're going to do a demonstration in each of the packages and take you through how the different packages work. So the first one is SPSS, which many of you will have used. We have a site license for this. You can also access it through, free through the virtual lab. If you apply to IMTS, you can do that if you're a staff or a student. And it's also quite cheap to buy a student package for SPSS as well. It's widely used in teaching both here and at other institutions. There are many, many online resources for SPSS, so you can easily find out how to do any particular method you want, either by um, using a YouTube video or online resources with um, actual code examples. It's a pull down menu package, so it's very easy to get started. It's very good for most standard and common advanced methods. It's got very nice missing data and multiple imputation options Options, and it also has introduced Bayesian analysis in the last couple of implementations, which is very good. And in the very last version, it's also introduced a meta-analysis capacity, which is nice um, with the recognizing the increasing demand for meta-analyses, particularly during COVID when nobody could collect data, everybody's decided to start analyzing everybody else's. So you need to need, um, have a meta-analysis capacity if you have a stats package these days. Also in version 28, there's a new um, syntax capacity, which is very nice, which I'll talk through. Some of the cons of SPSS though, is that it becomes very repetitive with the menu use and it's time consuming. So you really need to use the syntax if you're using it frequently. It also outputs absolutely everything. So more than you need. So often the output can be quite overwhelming and the graphing capacity is fairly limited, but it is editable. And also, just when you get used to SPSS, SPSS is actually currently beta testing a major interface change, which is actually very different to what it currently looks like. So one thing that we will emphasize throughout this is that change is constant and all of these packages are constantly changing. So even if you think that you're going to learn something and stick with it forever, it's going to change on you. Okay, over to Brad. Yeah, so I, I'm going to give you a bit of a rundown on R and R Studio. So R is free and open source, which is which is very important if you're trying to share with others. You, you can get anyone to download R on their computer. Um, the other thing it was it was released in 1995. It was developed by two researchers at the University of Auckland, um, based on an existing S plus software package. Now R relies on an active user community to develop and maintain. Dis discipline specific packages, which means that you get a lot of packages available to you. So usually if you've got a problem, you can find someone who's written a package on it. Um, it's specifically designed for statistical analysis. So a lot of the syntax around your standard statistical methodologies are quite straightforward, even if it is still a programming language. Um, and R is not usually used in and of itself. You usually, well, it's often used with an integrated development environment. The most common one used, the one that I use, and most people I've, I've, I've 
uh, collaborated with use is R Studio, which is free um, and you know downloadable on the computer. R Studio is a, a commercial entity though, and it does support businesses and there's uh, upgraded versions and um, you know support available if you had that money. But um, for most of us, uh, we are just using the free version. Um, are, like I said, extensive standard and advanced statistical methods. And there's constantly an increasing number of statistical packages. Um, it's quite standard now because R is pretty universal amongst many modern statisticians that whenever someone writes a new paper on a new statistical method, they will accompany it with some R code or some R packages. And so you can always be using the best, most up-to-date, most recent statistical research when you're using R. Um, R as, a, as cons, we, it is a quite a bit steep learning curve for those who haven't used programming languages and even for those who have. Um, learning a new syntax is always difficult and there's a lot of Googling involved and a lot of checking manuals. Um, it also relies a lot on dependencies and other researchers maintaining those dependencies, which means on occasion you might be using a package and then it will stop working. Um, it's, it's a little bit annoying, but usually with the most common packages, you can always, you know, load an older version of R to run it. Um, there is version specifics and you can always run virtual environments. So that. Um, workarounds require advanced knowledge. Um, note that can at least save the versions, as, as I just mentioned, um, but it is still changing constantly. So you have to kind of stay up to date to be on the ball with R. Um, there is also a new syntax, well, relatively new syntax uh, in R called the tidyverse, which allows you to do a heap of new data manipulations a lot easier than what you would in the base R uh, language. Um, but that means that you've kind of got this thing where two people might be speaking a different language. Um, but really important for R is that it is completely reproducible. So you can start with raw data and end with your outputs, with your documents, with everything you need. Okay, and recognising that R is often difficult to use, a lot of people have developed R user interface packages, which are free and they're click down menu based. And we'll be talking about one of those today, Jamovi, but I've just highlighted there the four, they're all very, very good to use. They're all free and they're all um, click and point and click and go interfaces. Okay, the next one is Stata. Now, UOW doesn't have a site license, license for Stata, but it's relatively inexpensive to buy and a lot of academics and students do use it. It's particularly good um, for survey analysis and many of the Australian surveys actually have Stata code for weighting or Stata, some people say it's Stata Stata. Um, so it's particularly useful for that. It's also very good for meta-analysis and there are also some user written files, um, for example, for step wedge designs, it's very good. It's also got good missing data capacity and you can do structural equation modeling in it very easily. And if you're in epidemiology, public health or social sciences, uh, then Starter is one of the packages that's used regularly. Some of the cons with Starter are learning the code. Again, it's got its own unique code. So you have to learn that if you want to use the coding options. And the menu, the menu driven, the click and go menu is not as user, user friendly as some of the other packages as we'll see. And again, it has a focus on that epidemiology, public health. So some disciplines um, don't use Starter. Yeah, so uh, just a little bit more about Jamovi, which like Marika said, is a user interface to R. Um, it, like R, is open source and it was developed by uh, two out of the three founders were Australian. So it's a, like a locally produced um, outcome for us. It looks a lot like SPSS. So if you're someone who doesn't really want to pick up programming, but still wants to learn um, in an R kind of compatible way, Jamovi is a really good option for it. Um, it has good support, longevity, that the amount of packages and modules being added to Jamovi is getting better and better as days go on. Um, and what I really love about Jamovi is that the, the output is immediately visible. So you can try things out. You don't have to run a procedure, try and work out what's missing, and then try and rerun it and constantly check and, and you get these long lists of outputs. It's great for teaching. 
Um, it's really simple to use. It has a free online textbook and many online uh, resources. And this is one of the reasons why we're pushing it for a lot in uh, teaching and will be standard in our teaching in UIW. Um, some of the cons to it is that when you want to generate output, it's currently only allowing you to output to PDF or HTML. You can output um, in Word, but you'll have to do a bit of copying and pasting, a little bit of you know manual click dragging and dropping. Um, unfortunately, with Jamovi as it stands, there isn't a lot of ability to edit or change your graphs. It's got a really good standard um, graph graphical production, but to be able to customize it and add those little features that you might want, you don't really have that opportunity. Um, it is dependent on existing models. It is still relatively new. So the capacity is still expanding. Um, but right now there's not, so there's no machine learning options. There's no AI modules. Okay, so on to SAS. Now we do have a site license for SAS only for the code version, but we can access SAS on demand for academics on the web. And I'll demonstrate both of you, those for you today. So it's really, um, it's been around for a long time and it's, it is the gold standard for pharmaceutical trials and for governments, although our use is increasing. So if you are considering a um, career in those sectors, then having SAS skills is very useful. It is currently developing an AI business market focus and it's planning to list on the, the stock exchange in 2024 and to make a substantial investment in its AI capacity. Um, the SAS Studio or the on-demand option that um, I'll show you does have pull-down menu options. Um, it, again, the menu options are a bit clunkier than some of the other packages like SPSS and Jamovi. And if you run the code-driven version, then that's that UOW has that you can get put on your computer, then you have to learn the code, which is unique to SAS. Um, but it is still currently, as I said, uh, the standard in those industries, although I, I would anticipate that with more R users coming through, that could change over time. And over to Alberto. So uh, Python. Uh, so uh, Python uh, is pretty much a general purpose programming language. So it is, uh, it is you know, comparable to C++, et cetera. It does run cross-platform. It was released uh, in 89, uh, really by one person. Uh, it, this is one of the ones that was created by one person. Obviously, there's lots of people who have now contributed to make it what it is. Uh, it has really nice interface with the low level languages. So if you're running some Python within your C++ or other things, it will just go in there and do good stuff with your GPUs. It is very used in, in uh, web development. And it has actually gained a, a lot of popularity for machine learning and deep learning with some of the things on the, the science kit packages. It is as just the others. It's also still supported by the community and it can be really used in a very scalable production environment. It has many packages. Uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, just uh, you know, resembles in a way like R, it can be used in an IDE so you can have again uh, reproducible things by using Jupyter, which uh, the little thing I'm going to show it's on a Jupyter book, which is then shareable and, and can be done uh, pretty much uh, running online. You don't, you can put it in any computer or you can just uh, go into Google Co Laboratory uh, and run it on your on their server. It is supposed to be very um, English like reading with no braces, no semicolons, and no indentation which could be good or, or bad. Right now it's number one for low level programming. So now we can talk about the cons. Uh, so some of the cons is that there, as of yet, not as many stats packages as R, uh, but there, ha there are many for AI and other kind of uh, programming. The same thing of no braces or columns, et cetera, sometimes ends up being a, a con, right? You, if you're used to having functions that have arguments, and then some of them have and some of them don't. So it can be uh, a little tough for beginners to read someone else's code, but it's yet kind of uh, intuitive for coding yourself. Visualizations are pretty good, but are not as good as, uh, as R, let's say. And you may have a lot of uh, memory usage uh, depending on, on the setup you have. Do not, not use, use Excel, Excel for, for data, data analysis. analysis. <laughs> okay. 
this is uh, uh, something that the three of us agree and many statisticians agree. There's a lot of uh, literature in this. Uh, some of the main things, there's no capacity to store or code your changes, right? Uh, and you could say that this happens with many of the menu-driven uh, uh, packages where you don't really record your clickings, uh, but the analysis is not reproducible. Uh, formulas are hidden in cells, and sometimes you don't know if a cell is a number or if it is an actual formula. Uh, up to several years, uh, the, the function for the standard deviation was wrong. Uh, the order of operations still today, if you do minus three squared, it will uh, it will give you a nine rather than do first the square and then the minus. Uh, so there are many things. It is limited on your data size. And the other thing that's uh, when it comes to visualization, the first thing it offers is a lot of chart junk, like 3D graphs. So there are many, many, many other things uh, you can see criers um, know there on friends don't let friends use excel for statistics and there's some other works in the literature uh, on the new versions of uh, excel 2003 etc still having issues uh, on random number generators etc so do not use it okay all right now okay we're already <laughs> already running a little bit behind so we'll get on with um the demonstration so what we're going to do here is we've got a sample data set and we're going to compare body mass index between um, in a sample between some people with diabetes and people without diabetes. And so BMI is a continuous variable and diabetes is a categorical variable. And what we're going to do is a t-test. So our research question is, is there is a significant difference between mean BMI in those with and without diabetes? And just so you can see what the answer would look like before we go and do it in all of the packages. So that's um, just a, a, the first seven rows of the data set there. Um, what we're going to do with each of the packages is we're going to plot our data. So we, you should always, always, always plot your data first. And we use a side-by-side -side box plot. We'll then check our assumptions of the t-test. So we'll check a quality of variance using Levine's test. And we use the shapiro wilk test to test for normality, and then we'll perform the t-test. So the way the results of this might be written for a paper are here. Um, and someone's been asking if we'll share the slides, which we will. But essentially, um, we do find a significant difference with the mean BMI being higher in those with diabetes than those without diabetes. And I've given a sample uh, data analysis section there and a way that you might write the, res the results. So depending on which discipline you're from and which journal you write for, you might have the t-test and the p-value or the confidence interval. And you might put in a plot like this one. This is a box plot that's been done in um, ggplot in R. So I'll just stop sharing that so that I can share now. Um, my SPSS and we'll start off by doing it in SPSS. So here's SPSS, it's got a spreadsheet that you can edit the data in and what we're going to be looking at first is plotting our data. All of the stats procedures here are under the analyze menu and you can see that there's quite a number of different statistical procedures. What we'll be looking at first is doing our side-by-side um, -side box plots and we'll do that using the explore function. So you can see it's easy to do the click down menus here. And we're going to have, I'll just reset that. So we'll have BMI as our dependent variable and we want to look at that by diabetes and to get our normality test. Now I realize I'm going through this quite quickly because we're just comparing the packages. This is not really teaching you how to do it. It's just giving you a, a flavor of how easy it is to do in the different packages. So if we press OK, we get our output. And you can see that there's a lot of output here. So it gives us our basic descriptives of our two groups. It gives us our normality tests, which are both not significant, indicating that the, um, that the data we could consider as um, potentially being normally distributed or not violating that assumption. 
and again, it gives you a number of different plots, but the one we're interested in here is the box plot. And you can see that both groups are reasonably symmetrical. So then when it comes to checking the next assumption, that's the homogeneity of variance using the Levine's test. In SPSS, it's actually quite easy because that's done as part of the t-test. So we just have to go into the um, compare means where we have our independent samples t-test and we want to compare BMI by the two diabetes groups. Now we need to tell SPSS what we've called our groups. So ours are called one for diabetes and zero for no diabetes. And if we just press continue and okay, you can see here that in the independent samples t-test output, it gives us our equality variance test here, which again is not statistically significant. So we can assume that the variances are approximately equal and we can use the equal variances assumed p-value. So here's our t-statistic and our de degrees of freedom and our p-value and also our confidence intervals here. So it's all fairly click and go in SPSS. We can also, in this new version, we can click on the syntax And that saves the syntax for you, which is really good for reproducible research and for coming back later on. And we can just press the run syntax and we can run the syntax that way. It also has this nice function in the latest version where you can add, a, um, add some text, which is really good. So this is important. In two years, when you look at it again. So you can document things here, like I did this analysis on um, the 3rd of December, or uh, in this analysis, I did such and such. So it's really nice here to be able to save some text so that you know what you're doing later on. Okay, so that's SPSS. I'll hand over now to Brad. Yeah, so I'm gonna take you through very quickly um, what this would look like in our studio. So for anyone who hasn't seen our studio before, it, this is what it looks like. You've got R down here. This is your console. So this is like the heart. This is the brain of, of your code. This is where you, you're going to put in all your, your commands and get out your output. You've got your environment up here, which is basically anything, any files that I've saved. And I've got a nice little viewer down here. Um, now this is called the script and basically it's where you're going to save the commands that you're not running just yet, but you're going to run in a second. Um, so with R, um, often you might need to install some packages. In this example, I need to install these two packages in order to run the code. Um, I've already done it. You only have to do it once. So once you've installed it, um, it's, it's there. You don't have to do it again. And R will automatically go online, check for you, find it, and download it. So it's really, really simple. Um, but whenever we use functions or, or commands from uh, those packages, we have to tell R to load that into our working library. You can do that pretty quickly with this library function. So if I just want to run this, I can load the library. I can just control enter and run it. Here I can read in my data. Um, but if you're not so comfortable reading in it with a command like this, you can always just, if you find where your data is in your files viewer, click it here and click import data set. And, and R's got this nice little functionality that pops up that allows you to read in your data um, and see what it looks like before you read it in. Um, so I've just read in my data with this command. In fact, I can just show you I've read in my data because if I return that into this console, I get this output. What I'm going to do here is just tell R that that diabetes variable is a categorical factor. Um, and I'm going to label it, give labels to it so that when I look at my data, um, I can see that now that means no diabetes and the other one says diabetes. And in fact, if you want to see the whole data set at once, you can use this view function and go through it that way. Um, so if we want to do our box plot, now the beauty of R is that it only ever gives you what you ask. So you have full control over everything. Um, so if I want a box plot, 
I can just use the box plot command and I can specify, well, what's my dependent variable? That's going to be BMI. And I'm going to express that in terms of my factors diabetes. So I use this little tilde to express that relationship. I tell it what my data set is. And look, why not? Let's, let's make it blue because blue is a nice color. Um, of course, you can always, you can do whatever you want to this plot. You can add a title if you want. You can change labels. You can add different shapes. You can layer the things on top of it. You have complete control over what your output looks like. But again, you have to remember, you need to know those commands. You need to know how to do it. So there's a little bit of Googling to try and work that out. And we talked about the tidyverse, how you would generate this in tidyverse syntax or what they call the grammar of graphics plot um, is you can use this ggplot function. And here, all I have to do is tell it what we call our aesthetic mappings. And that's basically saying, well, what do I want to be on my x-axis? I want diabetes to be on my x-axis. And what do I want to be on my y-axis? And so I want BMI on my y-axis. So I've mapped these two things. Um, and so you get two plots. They look pretty similar, but two versions of R. So you've got a lot of customization available. To do your descriptives, you can look at each of the data sets. You can split the data sets into two different data sets. One which contains everyone with diabetes and one which contains everyone that doesn't have diabetes. And if you want to just get, you know, your mean out, you just ask for the mean. You just say mean data one. Oh, and if you look at this, if you use the dollar sign here to ask which to select which variable, it gives you the, select, the suggestions. So it's quite nice. You, I never remember the names of my variables, so it's great to be able to, to select it that way. And it just turns it out. So you can do it one by one if you want. But of course, I'm lazy and I don't want to run lots of lines of code. So I can get it to produce a nice summary table as well. Again, this is all up to you, what you, what you want your output to look like. So I can tell it to summarize and I have to tell it which functions I want, but I want to summarize this data by the diabetes variable. So for both categories in a nice little data frame, if I run this code, I get my summary statistics table kind of like how you would in SPSS. Um, and if you don't like this functions of a functions kind of thing, you can use what's called the pipeline, which you read left to right and you go data, I, I split it by groups, uh, by diabetes, and then I summarize it. And again, I'll get the exact same thing. Um, to check my assumptions, I can just use the Shapiro test function. Again, it's already loaded in there, it's in base R and I can look at it in each of the subsets um, and I can just command it that way. Otherwise, again, I can construct a nice little summary table with that function there. Um, now for the Levine's test, I need to load another library. It wasn't in base R. So I'm gonna load this car library. And then I use the exact same syntax as I did with my box plot. I can run it and the output gets spread out here. You can see that the output is actually really small. It only gives you the bare minimum of what you need. And if you want it more, to give you more, you got to ask for it to give you more. Um, and with performing, to perform the t-test, again, very straightforward. All I have to do, same kind of syntax as before, but this time I need to specify that this is a pooled t-test because we're going to assume variances are equal. Um, and if I run that, I get my nice little output. Same value as what Marika got, same p-value, although it gives it to more decimal places. Um, and we get our 95% confidence intervals as well. Um, now, the big trick with uh, RStudio is remembering what functions are, what your arguments are, but you can always ask R for help. So if you want to ask R for help, all you have to do is say help on the whatever function you want an explanation for, and this little thing will pop up. And it will tell you, okay, so if I want to change to a one-sided t-test, all I have to do is specify this alternative argument. If I want to change my significance level, I can change this confidence level here. If I want to do a paired t-test, I can, I can change it here. So again, very flexible, a lot of control for the user. Um, and again, completely re reproducible. Because if I want to run this again, all I have to do is control A, control enter, and I do it all over again. Thanks. <laughs> okay, thanks, Brad. Um, it's back to me now, and we're going to have a look at Starter. So here I have Starter opened up, and 
you can see that it's similar to SPSS in that we can have a look at our data here and then we can also edit our data in that data editor. Our statistics are all under a menu option here. And again, you can see that there are a lot of different statistics. Data covers a lot of different methods, some of them quite advanced. Um, as I mentioned, it's got SEM, for example. So but we're going to be sticking to the t-test here. So the first thing we need to do is go in and have a look at our box plot, which is under the graphics menu. And we need to tell it which variable we're looking at. So we're looking at BMI. And I just got to move that. Okay. And we want to look at that by diabetes. So you can see there's a bit more clicking here than with SPSS. Okay. accidentally typed it twice. Okay, and so you can see our box plot here looks very similar to the ones that we've seen in the other packages. And then we want to go in and do our, um, our Shapiro walk test. So we have to look under distributional plots and tests, and we have our Shapiro walk normality test. And again, we're interested in our BMI. And something we just haven't mentioned is that um, when, when we're testing our normality, we need to do it by groups, just not for the group overall. So we have to um, do it by diabetes. And if we do that, you can see that for both of the groups, again, we're getting the same p-values as we have from the previous packages. So then we want to go in and test our whether our variances are equal. And we need to go into these all a bit hard to find in um, Stata, but again, a Google search answers most questions. And in this case, it's under the robust equal variance test. And we want to test BMI by diabetes. And they're actually, they're actually quite, the, the Levine's test is a general formula and there are a number of different ways you can do it, which is why we've been getting slightly different results in some of the packages. But the standard one that would be used is the one up the top here. Okay, and then we want to go in and do our t-test. So our t-test is under the classical tests. And we want to do our two sample using groups. And we have our BMI by diabetes. And you can see here that we've got the same T value confidence interval and P value as we've done with the other packages. So um, start as a nice package. It gives you the same sort of feel as SPSS, a tiny bit more clicking. We can also run using the syntax as we can in SPSS. Here's the syntax here. So you can see that all of that clicking is just could just be done in four lines of code. So we can just highlight that and click on the run. And you can see that it does the plot and comes up with the output again, just by writing in that four lines of code and clicking on it. Okay, so I think we're back to Brad again now for Jamovi. Yeah, um, so let me just share my screen. There we go. Um, so Jamovi looks like, when you open Jamovi, it looks a lot like SPSS. You've got your data viewer, you've got an output window. Now this is all within the same kind of frame, um, but it's looking quite nice, quite easy to use and quite friendly. Um, so for our data, we can specify our variables just like you would in SPSS. And if you want to change them, see here, I'm going to just move this one up so that I've got, I'm comparing diabetes minus no diabetes. But you can do all the kind of labels and variables curating that you do with SPSS. Um, to do your analysis, um, our, our first step, exploratory, our getting our plots. 
So I just go to this analysis tab, I pick exploration and I click descriptive. See, there's a lot less options here. Everything seems to be more in less click menus and all in one place. So um, I, I'm gonna set my BMI for my dependent variable here and my diabetes is what I'm comparing across the different categories. Um, now you see it as I add that, the output changes. So you can see as you go, you can try adding things and it's all live and interactive. And it's expressed in this results output, which you can edit. So if you wanna put notes, you can, um, that's great if you wanna remind you that you did something or um, if you wanna comment as you go. Um, to add statistics, again, all it is is a matter of clicking which ones you want. And you can see, you can try, you can go, oh, well, is my IQR that interesting? No, nah, it's not that interesting, I'm gonna get rid of that. Um, in fact, even your Shapiro look can be found in this, in this window. Um, but we'll, you can, we'll, we'll check that again when we get closer to doing the t-test. Um, and to do your plots, you just go to your plots tab. There's a few options here. I can get a histogram out, I can get a bar plot out, but we're after box plots. So I'm going to select the option for a box plot. Um, I can't really do much to change how this box plot look, but I can add a violin plot on top and I can, I can show you what my data looks like or the dispersion of my points on top. And I can also plot my mean if I'm so inclined. Um, but it's all in one window and it's all there easily customizable. To run our t-test, um, well, to do uh, run our t-test and check our assumptions, we can, you can do it all in the one window. We can go to our analysis t-tests. Here we'll be using an independent samples t-test. So let's open that up. Again, very similar windows to before. We've got our dependent variable that I'm going to specify here as the BMI. Um, and I'm gonna put my grouping variable down here and select that to be diabetes. And hopefully if it's done it right, yep, it's spat out the same statistic as we got last time. Um, but if you look at the different options here, my assumption checks can all be found down here in the same window as your t-test. So if I wanna check for homogeneity, I just select that option and my Levine's test come up. Also the variance ratio comes up as another F statistic that you can look at. Um, if I wanna check my normality tests, I select the normality tests options. And again, my tests of normality come up. Um, and I can also very quickly get some descriptives like before, but the descriptive plots here, well, that's just a confidence interval plot. It's another plot if you wanna have a look at it. Um, to get your confidence intervals, mean difference, again, all found, same spot, just a matter of clicking some buttons. And if you wanna check for the unpooled version, or even the non-parametric version, if you, if you have problems with your assumptions, they can all be found in the same window, just to click away. Um, and the, the other thing I wanted to point out with uh, Jamovi is that this is all R-based, this is all produced with R code. And if you wanna see what R code produced it, you can go up to these options here. Now these options give you a range of different things. So you can even change the color palette too for your plots if you want, um, but, if I just select this syntax mode, what happens is it tells me exactly what R code was used to, to produce each of these tables and each of these plots. So if I just go to here and I copy it, and let's hope, do I still have R open? I still have N version of R open, there we go. I can plug it in here and it will generate. <laughs> oh, of course, it's not the right R session, that's okay. Um, it can generate, if my data was loaded, um, the same output as what we would get in Jamodi. So um, you can actually keep track of your syntax just like you would with uh, SVSS, but then you can run that in R um, and it will produce all the nice plots, all the same uh, tables as you would. Um, but yeah, uh, and if you wanna add any other modules, right now I've got these modules added, all you have to do is click the Jamovi library and there's always new modules being added. So lots and lots of different packages available for you to add. All right, thanks guys. Great, okay. Thanks Brad. So it's back to me again, and we're going to look at um, SAS now. So um, this is SAS on demand. I've just opened it up because it, it takes a little while to log into it. And you can see here that um, I've loaded in my data already and we have um, all of the all of the stats menus under the tasks and utilities here in 
in SAS on demand. And you can see it's a similar sort of pull down menu to the others. It's just that this one's on the side. So what we're going to do for this one is we'll start off first by looking at our data exploration. And we just need to check that we've got our data in there. And we need to tell it which variables we want to look at. So we want to look at BMI and we want to look at it by diabetes. And we need to click on plots and we want a comparative box plot. Now to get things to run in SAS, we use the little running man here. You can see that all the code that we're using is coming up here on the right, but to actually run this, we just press the running, the little running person and it comes up with our box plots, which look very similar to what we've seen before from the other packages. Okay, so then the next thing that we want to do is look at our, um, our uh, assumption test. So the, um, the Shapiro Wilk test is actually done as part of the T test, but our Levine's test, we actually have to do through a one-way ANOVA. Now, if you were running this in SAS in code, you could call, call all of these up automatically just by using the code line. But because we're relying on a pull down menu here, we have to rely on where we can find these different tests. And a, uh, a quality of variances test would generally be found as part of an ANOVA. So our dependent variable again is BMI, and we want to look at it by, by diabetes. And if we look at our options, you can see that it automatically comes up with the Levine's test for homogeneity of variance. And of course, um, if you do remember back to your introductory stats, um, the one-way ANOVA and t-test are linked anyway by the F and the T distribution. Um, but if we run that, it comes up with our ANOVA results, which we're not interested in here, but it comes up with our Levine's test. And then when we want to go in to run our t-test, We do that here under the t-test menu and it gives us options for different t-tests. We want our two sample t-test. And again, we're looking at BMI by diabetes. And if we press our run, it comes up with our Shapiro Welk tests again for each of the groups. And it comes up with our t-test results here as we've found for for um, all of the other tests. Now, that's is that SAS on demand that you can subscribe to on the web. You just need to have a um, UOW email address to be able to do that. A student one works fine as well. If you want to get SAS installed on your, um, if you if you have if you have a university computer, you can order a copy of SAS or SPSS for that university computer through IMTS. If you want SAS for your home computer, then you could use the SAS Studio on demand. If you want SPSS on your home computer, then you could buy a student license. Now, with the, the version of SAS that the university has licensed that you could get put on your computer, um, your UOW computer, you would have to run SPS, have to run it through the syntax. So you can see here, it's a bit more complicated than the syntax I showed you for, um, for starter or indeed the syntax for SPSS. So this is the syntax to do all of that in SAS. And we type in all of our syntax and just press run. And it's just running all of those procedures now. And you can see that it's come up now with all of the output that we've just gone through. So there's a couple of options there if you wanted to um, access SAS through UOW. Okay, so now it's over to Alberto for our final package. So what are we gonna be looking at? Here, where are we, where are we? Here we are. So this is uh, our Jupyter book. So if, as you can see, it looks like it's, been, it's actually running on our web browser, which it kind of is. Uh, and as, uh, just very quickly, I'm just going to click in there so you can see that this is how you do the markdown and then you can just run it and then this is how it will look. So you can be doing your text and your coding 
in, in right now the functions and the default I have is that it does show everything I'm doing so that you see what we're doing, right? So just as Brad mentioned, uh, you also have to have some packages imported and installed. Here you do it by saying import, but once you do it, it's there. All right, so with this one, I imported the, the data. Uh, this one that I commented was uh, to create what the Bradley had done. So zeros are no diabetes, one is diabetes. But then I thought, oh, later on, I'm going to have to be typing no diabetes, diabetes. I'm lazy. I'm just going to leave them as zeros and ones. But here you have an idea of how the, the, the data looks, right? So now our question here was about, uh, uh, you know, getting to see the difference in BMI in the means. So as we said, always expose your data. So with the data here is the box plot. Uh, I have something here commented because it's another way in which you can do have done your your um, box plot. As you can see here, I have also the group by, which is something like what Brad was doing. Or here I can say column by what. Our box plots look pretty much the same, still symmetrical, still not nothing to worry. Uh, you need to do then your descriptives, right? So here. Uh, and I could have also created two data sets, one for non-diabetes, one for diabetes, but I just wanted to show how you can always subset things within a data set in, in, um, in Python. So that's why I left it there, uh, which goes against my laziness of writing, I know, but anyway. Uh, so now here it is, the, the describe by group. So we have the count, mean, standard deviation, and all the other things, a little bit like uh, what everybody has shown so far. Now you want to check your assumptions, and uh, there have been some questions in the in the chat. And you know this kind of workflow is the kind of workflow that you should be following, checking your assumptions, you're looking at your data. Uh, as you saw, Jamovi kind of lets you do everything in one go, uh, but you still need to click on the options. So no package right now. You say I want to do a t-test, and that completely does everything for you, right? Uh, just tell me what, and I'll even look for your data. So anyway, uh, checking the assumptions. Uh, here is the first Shapiro for uh, same the same statistic, same uh, p-value, and I'm just doing this in these two chunks. One is to see the result just blah as it spits out, and the other one is I'm doing okay. Let's print it nicely. And so, if my code was hidden, you would see this that is nicer than these other things. But same thing. Uh, so now we want to check our homogeneity of variances. So we do the bins. Uh, test and same thing I'm doing here you know give me the the value itself etc and print it out and so we have the same statistic for Levine's and the same p value so both tests are passed right so we can go on and do tests without fearing any violations have actually happened uh, and so here you can do just the t test now this is uh, there are several packages within uh, this still with the pandas, with the statistics one, there's one on pandas, but so here it is, uh, the, the test statistic uh, with the p-value and the difference. This I had to pull, one of the things I had to get it separate, it doesn't spit out the difference on its own. In, and confidence intervals, they're also not part of your t-test right away, but there is uh, within stats model, which is another package, uh, you can call them or you can program them yourself, right? So all of this is how I programmed it myself by hand and it will print it. And then there's this small instruction here just for doing it with that other, um, that other package. Anyway, if you run it, here you have the confidence interval by hand, 338 to 5.9, just like over there, or using the package at 338 to 59. So this is the nice thing about this uh, Jupyter codebook. I can uh, nicely go and say, well, you know what? If I want to start again, I can clear all the output and I can send this to someone else who will open it and it will already know, oh, you're using Python. And all they have to do is, you know, press control enter. There are other things that are nice about this uh, compared that are also like in R. If you start putting some instructions and hit tab, it will tell you, okay, you can complete some things. But I'll stop there. Thanks, Alberto. Um, and I you... should stop sharing. Oh. That's how I really stop. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. All right. Now, I forgot to do this at the beginning, which is, is not good because what I wanted to find out was um, I'm just going to, we need, we wanted to get some feedback about stats packages. So first of all, can I just launch this poll and find out um, what packages you're currently using? 
And then after what we've just said, um, I would like to get some more information about what you would like information on. So I'll just actually let that one run for a sec while I talk about the um, talk about summarising what we've found. So we're going to hand it over for questions in a sec, but we just wanted to to um, drill home a few points, I guess. So in order to sort of give you some advice to summarise it, these are the sort of things that we were thinking that the particular packages were good for. So. Jamovi is excellent for teaching. We're increasingly using it. It's, it's really good if you are only using stats infrequently because you can easily get back on it and work out how to do things. Um, it's got some very good basic analyses and some advanced methods, which are all easy to learn. And it's got good default options in terms of what it produces. So Python's strengths are really machine learning and AI. It's a very in-demand skill. It's good for regular users because um, it's easy to forget things if you're not using it all of the time. It's good for research collaborations and it's definitely for regular users. So RStudio is good at everything. I guess, you know, that would be our number one take home. If you can, if you can learn something, that would be the one. Data manipulation, visualization, advanced analysis. It's a very in-demand skill for jobs, promotes reproducible research. Um, but you do have to commit, it's got a steep learning curve. SAS is a good overall package. And if you're considering a career in um, pharma or government or some other industries, it, it is, is the industry standard and it's very good for big data and data manipulation. SPSS is a great overall package for most standard and many advanced methods and it's easy to learn and it's pretty easy to come back to if you don't use it for a couple of years. Starter again, it will, is a good overall package, um, many useful advanced procedures, and it is used very regularly in some professions, particularly epidemiology and public health. And it's particularly good for survey analysis, meta-analysis and structural equation modeling. And I guess our take home message, um, and the others might wanna to add to this, is that you're probably going to have to learn more than one package in your career. Um, things change, interfaces change, the type of offerings in the particular software change. For example, as I said, SPSS has just introduced meta-analysis, which is really nice. They're all changing significantly over time. So even if you get comfortable with one in a couple of years, if you go back to it, it might look completely different. If you publish, it's very good to learn a package that encourages reproducible research um, because that will make it easier for you to update your data, change things when reviewers request it. If you're looking for career skills to get a job, R and Python are definitely the ones that people are asking for. If you don't use stats much, it's probably best to stick to what you know and ask for help. And I guess really the take home message is regardless of the package, if you understand the stats, it's fairly easy to work out how to do it in all of the packages and to be able to interpret the output. So it does get back to that background knowledge. And if you are or more specialized methods or machine learning, the best package will depend on, on that particular method and the easy, ease of analysis for that method. Um, some of the packages don't have some of the advanced methods um, so you need to, if you're getting into more advanced modeling, you need to really think about um, your particular needs.